Did you know that there can be resonance between planes in your PCB? There can be resonance between vias and planes in your PCB. And this is something what will influence how your uh, PCB behaves. Did you know that when you think you are routing a track with 50 ohm impedance, in reality, the real impedance can be like way different? This video supposed to be a super simple video about decoupling capacitor and return current path, but uh, instead uh, in this video we are going to have a look on all the kind of simulations and uh, this video can give you some kind of overview of what you can do with your PCBs, what everything you can analyze and uh, what everything actually influence your PCB. You may be surprised. I was like, wow, okay, I learned a lot when I was creating this video. So in this video, we will have a look at uh, DC analysis, probably many people know DC analysis, AC analysis, SI, signal integrity analysis, but have you ever heard about PPR analysis? Okay, so if you would like to understand a little bit more about simulations, this video can be very useful for you. And uh, this video is not only going to be about simulations. Uh, the other purpose of this video is to show you that uh, what you think what may be happening on your PCB, it may be only small part of what is happening on your PCB or it may be actually something completely different what is really happening on your PCB. So what you think is happening on your PCB, it can be actually like very wrong. And that's the that's something what was kind of uh, very interesting to learn from uh, talking to Steve Sandler because I'm not expert for simulations and I had no idea what is happening uh, in my simulations why I'm not getting the kind of results what I would expect I asked Steve Sandler to help me with this and in this video what we are going to do, we are going to watch my call with Steve Sandler where he will explain uh, what kind of simulations we can do with the simple board what I wanted to simulate and he will also explain how to interpret the result of the simulations. Before I play the video from the call, uh, very quickly I would like to explain a little bit uh, what kind of board we are going to simulate so everyone understands what we are talking about. Uh, the board is very simple. There is only one signal and uh, half of the signal is routed on top layer, uh, second half of the signal is routed on the bottom layer. What is special about this board? The uh, reference plane for this half of the signal is on layer 2 and it is a solid ground plane. However, for the uh, part of the signal which is routed on the bottom layer, the reference plane is on layer 11 and it is a solid VCC plane. This is what is special on this board. And this is what makes everything complicated. Uh, if you don't know about the uh, reference planes, uh, very simply to say for high speed signals, uh, you need to have good reference planes for your tracks. And uh, usually the ground plane is really good reference plane, but what about VCC plane? Okay, and that's what we are 
trying to simulate here. So uh, sometimes you will find information that uh, if you have like uh, decoupling capacitors, which are connecting the ground plane and VCC plane together, then uh, VCC plane can also be a good uh, reference plane. And that's what we are trying to simulate here. Here you can see three uh, capacitors and these capacitors, they are all connected between ground plane and VCC plane. So for high speed signals or for high frequency signals, basically these capacitors uh, they are going to be or they supposed to be the short circuit and basically for high frequency signals so uh, the ground and VCC plane are like connected together. Makes sense, no? <laughs> it's not so simple. Uh, on the board you can also see two uh, connectors we are just using these connectors to basically specify where we connect the power supply and where we will be receiving the signal. That's everything what you will see in the video, in the simulation. So uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's play the recording from my call with Steel. Here it is. Okay. And so there is just your board um, brought into SIPI Pro. And I can see all the layers, which are kind of arbitrary. I generally turn off the dielectric because it just gets too crowded. And really what I want to see is I want to see the vias and I want to see where it is that the, uh, the conductors are. I can turn off the conductors also. And that's kind of nice because now I can just see the components and now I can just select just the traces that we're looking at. And that's a little bit easier to see. And you can see now that that top capacitor in the middle of the board doesn't have any connection at all to the signal lines. Uh, but you can see the single via that connects the top and bottom traces where you did the transition and you can see the two ports and and you can see the vias at the ends right um, and then i can also look at just the grounds if i want to so now i can see which layers are grounds and i can also see which layers of vccs okay but all i really care about is the signals right now and then uh, the very first simulation that i always do is a dc analysis yeah so you can see here that i set up a um, a DC analysis with the VRM at J1 and I put a sink at J2 and the currents and stuff are arbitrary, but I put it in at an amp. The default in the simulator is three amps, but if you simulate it at three amps, it's going to indicate a failure because the voltage drop is too high. So I just reduced that to, to one amp. And then the nets, you can see the nets that are, are showing here or signal ground um, and VCC, although VCC isn't actually in our direct path. And the models aren't actually included here. They're, they're not used even though I, I added them uh, because it's just a DC analysis. So it won't see the capacitors, but it's the reason that I'm showing that I have this VCC uh, net is because the capacitors are there. Why is that? It's because I did the AC analysis and then I set that up and then I copied it to DC. And so everything that was in the AC analysis got copied to the DC. I'm going to interrupt this call just very quickly. Uh, if you have not watched any of my previous videos using this software, I'm going to explain uh, VRM. These are some kind of power supply. Sync is something what is going to sync the current. So uh, on one side of our track, we are going to uh, connect power. And on the other side of our uh, track, we are going to uh, sync this one amp. And uh, in the simulation, we will be watching what is happening when this one amp is flowing through the track. Uh, the uh, component models, as Steve explained, you don't need them for this DC simulation. 
but he copied uh, these uh, settings from the other analysis because there are a number of different uh, simulations what you can do uh, once you set everything for one simulation you can copy these settings to different simulation so that's why he also has these components in this simulation even if they are not necessary here okay let's continue it's just kind of the way to do it whatever your workflow is is fine and then this is um, you know by default we can set the options and this includes the resistance in the ground which we're interested in and this is a very fast analysis uh, but then we can bring it up and you can see that it shows me that the the voltage actually got through from j1 to j2 so this is really just a con uh, a conductivity check right so this is uh, it just says that the signal actually makes it from one side to the other. And if I cared what the resistance is, it tells me that, you know, the, the resistance of the trace is about 58.8 millivolts. A half a millivolt of that is the ground and 58.3 is the signal. Uh, this is always good to do as a first simulation. And Heidi drilled this into me because almost every time I had a problem, she would show me that there was some connection that wasn't actually connected. Yeah, so she really drilled this into me when I first started. And it's always a good idea to run the simulation first. So this tells us that we actually do have uh, a connection from J1 to J2, and that's what we cared about. The second analysis that I usually do is the power plane resonances. And this looks at the, the planes. And again, it's set up uh, similarly. I have, you know, J1 is my VRM. Yeah, and I also have... Uh, what does it mean, power plane resonances? What is that? Uh, what, what does it mean, power plane resonances? So what it's looking at is it's looking at the planes and it's just going to find out whether or not there are any resonances, natural resonances in the plane, right? Every time you end up with a, a plane pair, two plates, they're going to resonate, right? That's cavity and the cavity is going to resonate. And what this analysis does is it looks at the power planes and it just looks for uh, resonances. And it's, again, a pretty quick analysis. So here I set up J2 to be my VRM and I set up J1 to be the sink. And it probably doesn't matter in this case, especially since it's a pretty symmetrical configuration. So it's kind of arbitrary. And there you can see all the three signals show up again. And even though the uh, the caps aren't uh, an and, important thing, and why it is important to uh, to simulate this? The power plane resonance, mm -hmm. um, because it's going to tell me where it is that I expect to see problems. And this is just one view. Um, again, it's a relatively simple one and, and a fast one to simulate, and so it gives you, gives you a pretty good overview of the circuit board as a whole. You don't have to do this. I'll show you that we can see the same things in the SI analysis, but this just tells us that it's actually the board itself um, that's the issue. And so the result of this analysis is that it said that it found three uh, resonances in the power plane. Uh, one is at 12.6 uh, megahertz. That one has a pretty big Q at our uh, Q of 48. There's another one at 291 megahertz, and that's got a Q of 45. And so that says that at those two frequencies, we can expect there to be uh, current flowing due to resonances in the plane. And so I can look at this in current density. And so here's the current density, and there it is at 12.1 megahertz, and here it is at 12.6 megahertz. We expect to see a resonance there. And you can see it's there, right? It's in the middle of the board, but it's not, it's not huge, um, but it's in the middle of the board. And if I go to the, the 290 megahertz where it said at a Q of 48, um, now you can see the, the resonances and where it is that those currents are being forced to flow. And that's the one that you were actually looking for is why do I have current flow in this uh, capacitor, even though there's no capacitor. Uh, but you can see that this says that that's just a cavity resonance in your in your board layout. So that's your stack up and 
and probably also to a large extent the vias. So it's just one view. Let's stop for a moment and uh, let's think what Steve just explained. Basically, there are some other factors in your PCB which can generate some noise or resonances which can run some kind of independently of your circuit. You have these components, uh, capacitors and nets and connections, which uh, you created because you would like to get some kind of behavior, but actually on your real PCB, there are some other things which are kind of independent of your circuit, and of your components, and these other things can also do something on your PCB. For example, resonance between power plates. And uh, if I didn't know this, then uh, when I, for example, have a look at, this, uh, at the results of these simulations, I would think my circuit is causing uh, some of these results. It's not true. My PCB does. So that's what is fascinating. Even it has nothing to do with your circuit, you will have resonance frequencies there because of the power plates. And uh, these resonances at these specific frequencies can maybe make some problems in some situations. And you may never find out where these resonances are coming from because your circuit is not working with these frequencies. And it is because of your PCB, because of your stack up, because how you ordered power planes. Yeah, this was like eye opening. Wow. Okay, let's continue. And I could also look at electric fields. And just to make it a little clearer, uh, let me go ahead and let me look at just the uh, E-field. Now you can see there's an E-field there again at 12 megahertz. Um, there's the 12.6, and you can see that shows up in the middle layer. And then we go back to 290 megahertz. Um, you can see here's the E-fields. And I can also look at the magnetic fields. And again, 12 megahertz, it's focused in that one spot on the board. And if we go to 290 megahertz, there you can see your resonance. You can see that it's in all the layers there. Like so this know. resonance is basically caused by, can we say like by stack up? Or that's your, that's your stack up. But I'm, I'm pretty sure your VAs are, are involved in that also. Uh, so if you just removed the vias that connect the capacitor, this would probably go away. If you change the stack up, it'd probably also go away. Let's take a look at the stack up really quick. And again, I you know I just kind of made this arbitrary. There were some errors in the in the dimensions, so I just kind of made this arbitrary. But yeah, it's fine. These layers they're really thin, right? That's a 2.6 mil layer. Most of these layers are really thin. What might be interesting is uh, since you're interested in transitioning from a ground reference to your signal to a VCC reference in your signal, it might be really helpful if you simulated this with only um, four layers, right? A top and a, light and a bottom and one ground and one VCC. And we didn't look at it yet, but you'll see that one problem is these signal traces are really low impedance. They're about eight ohms. And so there are at least two mismatches in this simulation, one from the 50 ohm ports to the traces, and another one from the uh, traces through the vias. So there aren't any two impedances that match. How did you set up the impedance of the port? Um, I'll, I'll show you that. Okay. So in power plane, we don't need to do anything at all. The power plane resonance, it does that all by itself. Um, we just put in the the uh, VRM in the sink. But what I'm going to show you next is I'm going to show you, uh, in fact, let me 
unload all of those. Just One more question. So basically yeah. this uh, simulation will uh, show us that at these frequencies, 250 megahertz and 12 megahertz, uh, there are these resonances and which are basically not even caused by our components and circuit or anything and there will Correct. be problems because of because of how the board is created. Correct. So I looked at this another way and of course I only looked at this from four different perspectives because it gives you a clearer picture if you look at it from a lot of different angles. So I would always do the DC analysis, uh, the power plant analysis. It's a very simple one to do so I'll often do it. And then I also did an SI um, analysis. And here we can set up the ports. And so I have uh, J1 as one port and J2 as the other port. And of course, all three nets are showing up again because again, I included the capacitors in the simulation. By the way, all these capacitors are the same model. Uh, and I just picked random-ish numbers. So a higher frequency ESR, 100 nanofarad uh, capacitor and about 300 picohenries of ESL. Okay. And those, those are kind of arbitrary. And of course, they're, they're frequency dependent too. So you can use any model you want, but this will give you a pretty good picture. And then uh, any options? I like to run logarithmic sweeps. The adaptive sweeps don't always work out well. And one of the things that you'll notice is in the simulation, you can get some really odd behaviors if the um, frequency points in the extraction don't exactly match the frequency points in the simulation. And so when you run the simulation, you'd also want, want to run the same span, 10 kilohertz to one gigahertz with 20 points per decade. And if you don't, you're gonna get some really odd behaviors. We don't really need this many points, but I wanted this many points because I wanted to be able to run a TDR. And of course, the, the more points we add, the better the TDR is going to be. And by default, I used uh, the uh, default options. I didn't include the resistive losses in the ground plane because they're really uh, almost non-existent and it would just make the simulation time run longer. But you certainly could check the box and include the resistive losses in the ground plane. It won't really make any difference, at least not for our uh, uh, interests. And then of course we can run S parameters and I already extracted this board so I can see the S parameters, uh, S11 and S22, and I can also see uh, S21. Maybe a dummy question. <laughs> Uh, these S parameters, they can help us to create models or uh, why we would like to... They can, and, and I'm just showing this because you can get, actually get this view right inside PI Pro, but it's not a great view. I'm going to show you a better view in a minute. Okay, and I can also see the TDR here. And so here I can look at um, the TDR from either port one or port two. And here you can see that um, this says that we have a delay of one nanosecond. So the pulse is starting at one nanosecond. And you can see here's the, the majority of your trace. You can see that there's a discontinuity in it, uh, but it's somewhere between eight and maybe nine and a half ohms. And if you took the geometric mean of those, it probably get you pretty close to the... So the, what uh, exactly this is uh, showing us? This is a pulse on input and pulse on output or... This is just putting a TDR pulse into J1 or into J2 and converting that to impedance, just like you would in any other TDR. So this is a direct measure of the trace impedance. This is how it looks um, if we were to put a, a TDR into it. Another interruption, because uh, there are a few things what I would like to talk about. The first one, uh, at this point of uh, our discussion with Steve, I uh, realized that maybe I should spend more time actually trying to measure my PCBs. Truth is, uh, I don't really have like any fancy equipment for measurements, so that's one of the reasons why I cannot really measure the real PCBs, but uh, 
the reason why you would like to know how to measure PCBs is not only to measure your PCBs, but it can help you to actually understand the simulations. This was very interesting. If you would like to understand simulations, knowing how to measure your PCBs, it can help you a lot. Uh, if you are not sure uh, what does it mean TDR, you can search for this. But once uh, Steve explained that the uh, TDR pulse uh, will show you the impedance of the track, what I did, I adjusted the stack up of the PCB and I uh, created a new simulation with a track which supposed to be routed by 50 ohm impedance. And when I uh, tried the simulation, the TDR simulation, it actually shows that the impedance of the track is 15 ohms. Why 15? It should be 50. And I've got lost again. So I had to send <laughs> email to Steve and ask him why I'm getting again something different as what I would expect. And uh, this was answer from Steve. Your trace impedance is appearing to be low, but also the bandwidth of the measurement is very low. And again, something what is telling me, learn how to measure properly. Yeah. Since your TDR pulse is positive, impedance dips are shunt capacitors and impedance peaks are series inductors. So the low trace in impedance indicates that there are capacitive terms somewhere, could be around the vias. I would run the extraction to about 10, 20 GHz and try the TDR again. It will have much higher resolution. As you are seeing firsthand now, this is much more complicated than a simple rule of thumb. So uh, that's what I try to say at the beginning of this video. Everything is much more complicated than what you may think. And what Steve suggests, uh, what I could try next is uh, maybe just simulate two layer PCB uh, with one trace. The top uh, two layers, signal and ground, or three layers, signal, ground, signal. Simulate uh, too much uh, higher frequency scene since you want a resolution of much less than the electric thickness to clearly see the via. Okay? And uh, he also sent me simulation uh, with TDR at 10 gigahertz, uh, so you can see the difference from uh, our call where the uh, TDR was very simple. Now this TDR is a little bit more complex and this is what Steve explains that what you can see, what you can actually see in these results. Uh, the first peak is likely the poor launch ground via and the second peak is likely the via at the center of the trace. Okay, so this is basically our trace and this is the via. The, that's how this TDR pulse can be useful if you know what you are doing and how to measure it properly. Okay, let's continue with the call. Of course, to do a better view, we can actually go ahead and generate a test bench of that and it'll take all of this and it'll put it into a schematic for us. And I already did that too. And so I can open that schematic. And now here you can see is the circuit board. And so all of this was generated automatically by ADS. It took the circuit and it turned it into a, a, a five port S parameter file. And uh, by default, it takes the reference node and it uh, adds a short to ground. You can float that if you want to. The way that ADS works is that it creates all of the networks in this board to a T network. 
So every component, independent of where it's connected, is reflected as a connection to ground, or in this case, to the reference plane. Right? They like to call them reference planes. So even if I have a series capacitor, it's going to show up with a connection to the reference plane. And they do that just for the um, ability to simulate it faster and easier. And here are the three capacitors, and I can turn them on and off, and I can change the parameter values. It, it tells me what the parameter values are here. And of course, it also added the two ports, right? So, um, so I added the two ports here. And rather than calling them a 50 ohm ports, I gave it a, a variable. Because in a variable, that way I can tune it. Okay. Um, and if I go ahead and I simulate this with a tuning knob. Okay. Now you'll see that it gave me a tuning knob for the port impedance, and it also gave me the, the plots. Some of these I configured just a little bit. Um, but here, for example, we can see S21 in dB in the upper left-hand corner, and it's a through trace. So we would expect it to have zero dB. And of course, uh, we would expect it to have some linear attenuation with frequency, right? And Tim Wang talks about his rules of thumb and Eric Bargainen has his rule of thumb of how the signal should attenuate per inch per gigahertz in a, in a board. But remember that 290 megahertz that showed up as plane resonance, that's M5 here. So uh, what, okay, I, I have no idea what exactly this graph shows. It says like at this frequency, there is a problem, I guess. <laughs> Right, exactly. So, so in a normal trace, if this were a really good trace, if we took a, a cable and we connected one a cable from one end to the other end, we would expect to get a flat line, and we wouldn't expect any attenuation if it were a perfect transmission line. So it so would be just case, zero all the time. Was that? It would be just zero all the time. It would be, it would be a zero all the time, just a straight line. Okay, now if I look at, at this from S12 and I look at the phase, you can also see the phase that goes from minus 180 to plus 180 degrees at 290 megahertz. That's the resonance. And you can see right there at 290 megahertz, it also crosses zero. So there's zero phase shift to 290 megahertz. That defines it as a resonance. How fast this transition occurs, that's the Q that they referred to in the power plane resonance. And the faster this transition is, the taller this peak is going to be. Um, but what I wanted to show here is what happens if I change the port impedance. So I could make this uh, 50 ohms. Let's just uh, type that in here. This is easier than trying to slide it to exactly 50. Okay, and there's my 50 ohm ports. And now you can see it looks quite different uh, with an attenuation starting at 10 megahertz. And you can also see the big peak here that shows up at 290 megahertz. And there's that power plane resonance again. And now you can see we're crossing zero a couple of times because we have a really severe mismatch now. So the eight uh, ohm, that was exactly the uh, impedance of the uh, trace. That's the characteristic impedance of the trace. And you see I can adjust this now. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So when you go closer to eight, then it's the best. And if you go lower or, or higher, then it's worse. Exactly. And so where it is that we get the best match, that's also the characteristic impedance. So we got it from the TDR, right? And I said it was somewhere between eight and 10 ohms because it wasn't really just a flat line. And if you took the geometric mean of that eight and 10 ohms, you'd end up somewhere around this nine and a half ohm number. And so that is the, the ideal characteristic impedance of that trace. Now there's really nothing wrong with having a nine ohm trace so long as it's matched to something that's nine ohms, right? Uh, but if you don't match it to nine ohms, then, then you have a problem. And here it, it's not. And so that's why we see these big resonances that are showing up. But, 297 megahertz, and that's what you're seeing um, in those current flows in your board. And now, with the, in the window, what you had open, you were changing what impedance or the output the impedance? impedance of the port. So if I go back here, here's my... Ah, point. okay, I understand. Okay. So, and so instead of calling those 50 ohm ports, I said I can make them anything I want. 
I'll just assign a variable name to them. Cool. And now I can watch how it moves. And I, I showed it also in linear scale. RF guys tend to like linear scales. Power guys tend to like log scales. And, and there's a good reason for that. I talk about that in a lot of my lectures and also in my classes. So if you were to look at this from a, a power integrity perspective at a linear scale, everything we were interested in seeing would be somewhere along this left edge of the, of the screen. You'd never ever even see anything, right? It'd be maybe the first 100 kilohertz or so, or maybe a megahertz that would be the power supply. It'd just be this very little line here at the edge. Wouldn't be able to see it at all. Um, so we want much bigger dynamic range. We want to be able to see everything from, you know, our, our VRM all the way up to the high speed ASIC. And so log does that much better. Also, when we look at how poles and zeros work, right, an attenuation of a pole is 6 dB per octave. A capacitor impedance is 6 dB per octave. And so in a log scale, those show up as nice straight lines. In a linear scale, they don't. So why is it that RF guys like to look at linear scales? Because they're always looking at harmonic structures, right? And that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for that large dynamic range. They're generally looking narrow band, but they're looking at harmonic structures. And so this is a simple way for us to look at, at how good this path is. And like you said, we would really like this to be a nice straight line, and it's not. This discontinuity is where you're seeing those currents. The 290 megahertz, that's where it got flagged as a power plane resonance. And that's where all of the current is flowing is when we get to that 290 megahertz. And that's where that phase crosses zero. And uh, to influence these 250 or 90 megahertz, uh, you would need to change stack up. Yeah, for example, uh, have the distance between power plane and ground plane a little bit uh, bigger right. or or move the uh, layers around the stack up or something like that, yeah? Correct. Right, and remember when you go from the top side of the board to the bottom side of the board, you lost all of your impedance matching, right? Because there, no, there is no ground surrounding that. So it's not, a, it's not a, a controlled impedance trace going through the board. And, and so you kind of lost it there too. But yes, if you changed your stack up, you would impact this. Um, likely if you changed your via holes and, and changed the position of the vias, you'd also impact this. Uh, you know, the vias as they're shown, let me go back to the um, drawing here. Let's close that. And let's just go ahead and let's um, look at this from a top view perspective again. Okay, and now let me go ahead and just turn on the uh, um, traces. Let's see, I think the ones I want are VCC and ground. And now you can see the, the traces and the vias right there. And so you have these traces that come out of the component. And so those are each inductors. And then the inductors go through this drill hole and the drill hole is also um, an inductor. So this makes the effective series inductance of the capacitor really, really high. So there's, there's a couple of ways that you could avoid that, right? So basically this is uh, creating uh, or this is also helping to create the resonance because this is the inductor part, and then we have the capacitance part, which is between the ground and VCC plane. So Correct. it's like- and Remember, the plane is a pair. So the plane is both inductive and capacitive. Uh, <laughs> these traces are probably much higher inductance than the plane, since the plane is really thin, right? So these inductors are probably much higher. You'll see a lot of plots of decoupling in, in the in the books. I think it's even in Eric's book and they show the placement of the vias. And they say, if you put the vias at the ends of the caps, that's really bad. Yeah. This is probably a little bit worse than that. So um, this is basically inductor in parallel with the capacitor, which is created. Series, it's in series with the capacitor. Yeah, it's series. In series, right. So if I really cared about minimum ESL, I might actually put the via in the pad. I know a lot of people don't like that, but that would work. If the component is big enough, I can actually put the vias in the corners here, right? So I can put one via 
right here in this corner and the other via down here in this corner. Whoops. And then they'll be much, much closer together. And if they're much closer together, uh, then the inductance gets much, uh, much lower. And of course, there is some point at which they will also match the characteristic impedance. One of the things in our in our probes, when we make our one port and two port probes, one of the things we really have to worry about is that we need to make sure that we match the impedance even in the vias. And so the vias themselves are a controlled impedance trace. But how do you match impedance in vias? Uh, by the diameter and distance between them. If we didn't do that, we'd have discontinuity there also. So like our new one port probe, it's a 14 gigahertz probe. That's really broadband. And so going through the vias and the circuit board, if we had a mismatch, we would never make it to 14 gigahertz. In fact, something would probably end up looking like a quarter wave stub and, and that would be disastrous. And so we need to match the impedance um, all the way up to the, to the probe pins and all the way through the vias. And we control that all the way up to 20 gigahertz. And so where it is that you put those vias is really important. And the size of the drill hole is also important. Around the via, or uh, sorry, uh, the hole inside of the via, yeah? Right, this is, this is that whole idea of the antipad, right? So we use the antipads to make sure that we didn't lose the impedance of our trace when we went through the via. And so that's the idea of the anti-trace. You can control the, the size of the hole here, right? That would help you know, the size of the drill. That would also change things. And of course, to have these stubs sticking out, that's a really bad idea. You really want to get those as close to the capacitor as you can. And to get minimum inductance, you'd want those two vias to be as close together as they can. Now, everyth everything that uh, has a transmission line that's not impedance matched is going to have resonances. And so what we want to generally try to make sure of is that if there is a, a mismatch, there's only one. And, and the board itself generally can't be one of them. And we show this in our classes too. If I take a coaxial cable and, uh, and I attach one side of it to an oscilloscope and the other side of it to a signal generator, you know, what happens when I measure that signal? Uh, I can make a, a high impedance attenuating probe. I can put a 500 ohm series resistor in series with the tip of the cable, but it only works if the scope impedance and the cable impedance match. So if I have the cable is 50 ohms, the scope is 50 ohms, then I can put anything I want in front of the cable. If I made the impedance of the generator really low, like one ohm, and we, we did that exercise in our class, we can make that one ohm, then the, the scope is 50 ohms and the cable is 50 ohms, uh, that's okay. And if I make either the scope one meg ohm or I make the cable a different impedance, then it's not gonna match and I'm gonna end up with these resonances. So as a, as a general rule, what I'd say is that the transmission line itself has to match one end or the other. And, and we wanna try to minimize the discontinuities and we have a couple of them here. One simulation that I didn't do that would probably be worth doing is that with the capacitors removed, we can also look at the capacitors at the end near each port, right? There's a cap near J1 and there's a cap near J2, and we can use those as ports also. And then we can do the same analysis I did with J1 and J2, and you can see the characteristic impedance of the plane. And you could also see what the plane resonance is in the VCC and ground. I'm going to interrupt the call again because um, at this point uh, I've got quite nervous <laughs> because uh, I never really realized how bad everything goes for the higher frequencies. What everything, what every small piece of track or connection or via is going to influence the signals which are running about some frequencies. And uh, in this graph, you can see for all these uh, lower frequencies, everything is perfectly fine, but suddenly there is a frequency when everything is going to be bad. And uh, 
I think this is the uh, point when you may realize that uh, when people are saying uh, if you are designing boards up to 3, 5 gigahertz, yeah, you can somehow do it and uh, you will go around of all these uh, small, uh, not very perfect stuff what you may do on your PCB. But as you go higher, 5 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz and higher, then uh, from all these simulations and uh, from all the talks uh, to um, other people, I have this feeling like about 5 10 gigahertz you really need to know what you are actually doing because everything is going to influence the quality of the signals on your PCB and everything, every small piece and via is going to influence how your board is going to behave. But that's good that uh, we realize this because it makes you to be more aware and more careful when you are designing signals which are going to run at these higher than 5 gigahertz frequencies. It will make you to realize that maybe um, it's useful to actually spend some time trying to um, learn all this new high-speed stuff which is going to be quite important maybe for your future designs. And maybe it will kind of uh, give you an idea that maybe it's time to try to play with some simulations. But we have not finished uh, completely. Uh, there is one more simulation what uh, we are going to talk about. So uh, let's continue in the call. So the AC analysis, this is um, the generic power integrity simulation, right? One side is a VRM and one side is a sink. And again, I've got the ground VCC and signals. And again, I get the same three components. I set the same frequency range and you can extract those fields, which I did. And then we can go ahead and we can look at that also. Now in power integrity, the first thing we would look at would be the impedance. And there is our impedance with the VRM open and there's our impedance with the VRM closed. And you can see we have resonances there also. We can also see that in S parameters, right? And this will let, let us look at the S parameters from the AC analysis too. These are uh, the, the same difference. S parameters what we've seen in SI analysis, correct? Yes, that's correct. And we can also see the field plots, just like we did before. Okay, and And again, this is three dimensional. And there we can see um, at all of the, the different frequencies. And in fact, every frequency I've simulated will be here. So there's our 12.6 megahertz. So what exactly this uh, electric field uh, show us? How people can imagine what kind of information they can uh, see EMI. in this electric EMI field? EMI is going to be centered around uh, E fields and H fields, um, and they generally correlate with the current density, especially um, when we're looking at the board, because that's we're looking at near field, we're not looking at far field. Uh, and let's go back up to the 290 megahertz. You can see I got an awful lot of data points now, but here's one around 280 megahertz. And now you can see there's the current density again showing up. And you can even see which layers it's showing up at. And I can pick a couple of frequencies on each side of that.
and then we can uh, get past it. And you'll see that we, we actually went through the resonance, right? It's gone. So all of these simulations are showing exactly the same thing. They're just showing it in slightly different ways. And, and some people understand some better than others. And I think that just depends on maybe what you grew up on. Uh, but in every one of these simulations, you can see that um, nasty resonance that shows up around, you know, 280 to 300 megahertz. And you can see how it actually penetrates the board. And there it is right in the middle. And uh, what I would expect, I would uh, expect to see some current to flow through this uh, capacitor, which is connecting the ground and VCC planes together. You would if it had decent um, inductance, but the inductance is so high that it's much easier to go through the planes. Okay, so basically what you are saying is this one capacitor, which we place between this ground and VCC, it is just not enough to make the second, uh, it's not enough to um, kind of connect the ground plane together with VCC plane, the way that the VCC plane will be basically ground plane for the bottom signal. Correct. Only what we can see is the uh, are the effects which are between the planes, and these effects are much higher than this one capacitor which is on the board. Correct. And and those multiple um, layers, the VCC and ground layers, are actually resonating with the vias. And so at, at uh, 290 megahertz or 300 megahertz, you're seeing a really nice cavity resonance. And when you have a resonance, the current flows is going to be really large. In fact, they're going to be multiplied by Q, right? So what we would see in a normal signal is multiplied by Q. And the power plane resonance analysis told us that in this case, the Q was, I think it was around 45. And that says we're going to see current flows that are 45 times higher than our signal current in the cavity. They can and these really currents will be uh, in the place between VIA uh, and the power plane, yeah? Correct. You can see it. It's, it's here in this picture. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. Let's stop the call. And uh, again, think what Steve explained. He said that the results, what we see here, they are not actually caused our, by our signals, by our circuit. This, what we can see here, is actually created by the PCB and uh, if you don't really understand what you are looking at then you may interpret these results the wrong way. I learned so much during this call. It was so interesting. What I really like uh, is that Steve he went through these multiple kind of simulations and explained what you can learn from each of these simulations. Also, I could see how he set up the simulation. So I have to say like, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Steve, uh, for helping me with this video because uh, I learn a lot. And also, I need to say this video was your idea. Uh, I created this video based on uh, your feedback, based on your comments uh, under uh, my previous video about stitching vias, which I created a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you left uh, many messages on LinkedIn and also uh, in the comments and uh, many people ask me to run uh, similar simulations for uh, different frequencies for higher and lower frequencies and also with these uh, decoupling capacitors. So I really hope uh, this was something what was interesting for you. It was definitely it was not what I was expecting but uh, 
it was very, as I already said in this video, it was very eye-opening that uh, not everything is happening the way as you may imagine. So thank you very much uh, for this idea. Uh, without your help and without, without your comments, this video would not exist. By the way, if you don't know, my name is uh, Robert Feranek. I'm from Federal Academy and I really hope you learned something new and I really hope you found this video interesting. If you like this video, don't forget to press the like button. If you would like to see my future videos, don't forget to subscribe. It helps a lot. And uh, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye.